Welcome to the Tell Me What I Need to Know series. This unit illustrates a brief overview of the accounting approaches for common stock investments. There are three methods that investors may choose from to account for their investments. The cost method, the equity method and consolidation. This doesn't mean that investors can choose between the three. Each method is designed to be applied to specific investment circumstances. The cost method is appropriate for investments in the common stock of investees in situations where the investor cannot exercise significant influence over the investee. Significant influence means that the investor is able to help determine important operating and financial decisions of the investee and will be discussed in more detail later. The cost method is also the default method if neither the equity method nor consolidation applies. In using the cost method, investors are also required to observe Financial Accounting Standard 115, codified as ASC 320, which requires that marketable securities are remeasured to fair value at the end of each reporting period if their fair value is readily determinable. It should be noted at this point that investors may choose to account for investments in common stock using the fair value method in lieu of the cost method. FAS 159, codified as ASC 825, allows companies to select the fair value option for accounting for certain assets and liabilities and will be discussed more later. This slide illustrates the application of the cost method. The first journal entry shows the purchase of common stock by the investor and is recorded at cost. When the investee declares a dividend, the investor will receive its pro rata share of the dividend payment based on the percentage of the investee stock that the investor owns. Assume the investor owns 10% of the investee's outstanding stock, then the investor will receive 10% of the investee's dividend payout. At the point at which the investee declares a dividend, you may remember that a legal liability is created. Accordingly, the investor records its pro rata share of the dividend as a receivable and this is illustrated in the second journal entry. This slide illustrates the application of FAS 115. You may recall that FAS 115 requires that each reporting period, marketable securities are examined for changes in fair value. If fair values are not readily determinable, the securities are carried at cost instead. Both of these journal entries illustrate the required FAS 115 fair value adjustment for appreciated stock that has readily available fair value information as measured at the reporting date. The first case illustrates an unrealized gain in the fair value of trading securities. In this case, the unrealized holding gain becomes an income statement line item. The second journal entry illustrates an unrealized holding gain in the fair value of available for sale securities. In this case, the unrealized holding gain flows into other comprehensive income. US GAAP requires investors to use the equity method for accounting for the investment in an investee where the investor has the ability to exert significant influence over the operating and financial decisions of the investee. Significant influence is assumed to be present if the investor owns 20% or more of the outstanding voting stock of the investee. Influence in this case arises from the investor's ability to participate in the voting rights of shareholders. Even in the absence of sufficient ownership in the investee, there may be other factors that give the investor significant influence. One example where this might occur would be if the two companies have common management. A curious feature of the equity method of accounting for investments in common stock is that the investment account is carried on the investor's books at neither cost nor fair value. It is carried on the investor's books at cost with certain adjustments as described on the next slide. The first journal entry on this slide illustrates the investor's purchase of common stock for cash. The purchase is recorded at cost and in this respect is the same as the journal entry under the cost method. 
Because the investing company is assumed to be able to have significant influence over the investee, a reportable event on the books of the investor occurs when the investee reports net income. Specifically, the investor makes a journal entry recognising its share of the income of the investee. It does this by increasing the carrying value of the investment account and crediting a revenue account. In a similar vein, when the investee declares dividends, it's assumed that the investor has the ability to command significant influence over the dividend decision. For this reason, it's considered inappropriate for the investor to recognise income from the receipt of investee dividends. Instead, the investor recognises an asset, dividend receivable, and reduces the carrying value of the investment account by its pro rata share of the dividends to be received. If the investee were instead to report a net loss for the period, the investor recognises its pro rata share of the net loss by debiting a loss account and by decreasing the carrying value of the investment account. Suppose the investor were to purchase shares in its investee between investee balance sheet dates. In this case, the investor would prorate the equity in the investee's net income to the fraction of the year that the investor owned the stock. The treatment of investee dividends in this case would depend on the declaration dates of the dividends. Dividends declared before the purchase date of investee's stock are ignored. Dividends declared after the purchase date are accounted for in the normal way. Suppose the investor were to purchase additional shares in its investee. In this case, the cost of the new shares is simply added to the investment account and both purchases are carried in the same account. Income and dividend calculations in this case must be figured to make sure that only the correct amount of income is recognised and only the correct dividend adjustment is made to the investment account. The next slide illustrates how this works. Suppose ABC Corp purchases 20% of the shares of XYZ Corp on January 1st 10x for $1 million. Suppose also that ABC Corp purchases an additional 20% of XYZ stock on July 1st 2010x for $1.2 million for a total holding of 40%. Assume also that XYZ Corps reports net income of $100,000 on December 31, 2010X, earned uniformly throughout the year, and assume that XYZ Corps declares a $50,000 dividend on December 31, 2010X. The following discussion assumes that ABC Corporation is able to command significant influence over XYZ Corps. This slide shows the two stock purchases, both of which are recorded at cost. Notice that both purchases are debited to the same asset account. The first journal entry shows how ABC Corporation calculates its pro rata share of XYZ's income. Note that because ABC only owns 40% of XYZ, its share of XYZ's income is in any case limited to a maximum of 40%. Notice also though that ABC's share of XYZ income is also limited to the portion of XYZ's fiscal year that ABC owned XYZ stock. In the case of the first 20% purchase, ABC recognises 100% of its 20% share of XYZ income because ABC owned these shares for the whole of XYZ's fiscal year during which it earned its net income. In the case of the second purchase, ABC may only recognise half of its additional 20% share in XYZ income because its second purchase occurred halfway through XYZ's fiscal year. Thus, since XYZ's income from January 1st to June 30th is assumed to be $50,000, because we assumed XYZ earned its income evenly throughout the year, we multiply $50,000 by ABC's 20% initial ownership to give $10,000. This is ABC's equity in XYZ net income for the first half of the year. 
Also, since XYZ income from July 1st to December 31st is also assumed to be $50,000, we multiply $50,000 by ABC's 40% new total ownership percentage to give $20,000. This is ABC's equity in XYZ net income for the second half of the year. Therefore, ABC's equity in XYZ's earnings for the year is $30,000. The second journal entry shows how ABC reports its pro rata share of XYZ dividends. Since the declaration was made on December 31st, at which time ABC owned 40% of XYZ, ABC records its full 40% share of dividends in XYZ. At this point, you should have noticed that dividend payments of an investee whose investor is assumed to be able to exert significant influence are treated as a distribution of the investor's investment. Suppose an investor wishes to sell part of its investment in the investee. As is the case with the sale of any asset, the potential for gain or loss arises. To correctly calculate any gain or loss, the investor must account for investee net income and dividends up to the point of sale. This establishes the book value of the investment at the date of the sale. Gain or loss is calculated by comparing the sale proceeds to the book value of the portion of the asset sold. If the proceeds exceed the book value, the investor recognises a gain on the sale of the investment. If the proceeds are less than the book value, the investor recognises a loss on the sale. After the sale of a portion of the investment, potential significant influence over the investee may be relinquished. In this case, the investment is accounted for using the cost method from that point forward, with the remaining book value of the investment becoming the new cost. Let's look at how this works. Suppose ABC Core owns 40% of XYZ Core. The investment account has a balance of $1 million at the beginning of 21X. Suppose also that XYZ Core reports $100,000 of net income for 21X, earned evenly throughout the year. Now assume that ABC Core sells all of its interest in XYZ Core on March 31st, 21X, for $1,050,000. First, we calculate the book value of ABC's investment in XYZ on March 31st, 21X. We start with ABC's January 1st, 21X balance of $1 million in the investment in XYZ and we add ABC's 40% share of XYZ's 21X net income. We calculate ABC's pro rata share of the partial year of XYZ net income as follows. First, multiply the $100,000 of XYZ net income for the whole of 21X by ABC's 40% share and further multiply by the portion of 21X that ABC held the XYZ stock during 21X. Since the sale occurs at the end of March, ABC has held these XYZ shares for 3 months out of 12, so we multiply by 3 twelfths to give $10,000 of equity in XYZ net income for the first three months of 21X. The book value of the XYZ shares at the end of March 21X is therefore $1,010,000. This is the January 1st balance plus the equity in XYZ net income for the first three months of 21X. Next, ABC must calculate the gain on the sale. If the sale proceeds are $1,050,000 and the book value is $1,010,000, then the gain on the sale must be the difference between these two, i.e. $40,000. We know ABC made a gain on the sale because the proceeds were greater than the book value at the date of sale. So far, we have considered the options for accounting for common stock investments where the investor was unable to exercise control over the investee. To recap, if the investor has no significant influence over the investee, the investor must either use the cost method, adjusting for fair value per FAS 115, or may elect to use the fair value option instead. If the investor does have significant influence over the investee, 
the investor must either use the equity method, adjusting for investee net income and dividends, or may elect to use the fair value option instead. Control over an investee is assumed to be present if the investor owns more than 50% of the voting common stock of the investee. However, just as significant influence may be present with less than 20% ownership of an investee, it's also possible that control of an investee may occur with less than 50% ownership. We nevertheless use the 50% rule in the absence of evidence to the contrary. If it is determined that control over an investee exists, the parent company must prepare consolidated financial statements and the subsidiary prepares its separate financial statements. There is no fair value option to a parent that is able to exercise control over a subsidiary. Accountants may need to perform the consolidation process under either of two circumstances. First, two companies may engage in a business combination that results in only one remaining entity. A statutory merger occurs when one company acquires another company and the latter company no longer exists as a separate entity. In a statutory consolidation, two companies join together and cease to exist. Instead, a third company is formed. In both of these cases, the separate financial statements of the two entities will need to be combined or consolidated once and for all. Subsequently, the new entity will report its activities on one set of financial statements. The second consolidation scenario occurs when one company acquires most or all of a second company and both companies continue to maintain their separate identities. The acquiring company is referred to as the parent company and the acquired company is referred to as the subsidiary company. In this case, the separate financial statements of the parent and subsidiary are consolidated every year by the parent and the subsidiary continues to present its separate statements. Do be aware also that it is possible for a parent company to have one or more subsidiaries. In the process of consolidating financial statements, the separate statements are essentially just added together. Of course this is a gross oversimplification and some intercompany items also need to be adjusted or eliminated. Although the acquisition method is the only permitted method of consolidation for companies that combined after 2008, previously two other methods were available, the purchase method and the pooling method. Accountants should be familiar with all three methods because the old methods are still in use by parents of combinations that occurred prior to this date. The fair value option permits companies to elect to account for most financial assets and liabilities at fair value. The decision to apply the fair value option is made on a security by security basis and is irrevocable once elected for that security. It is perfectly permissible for identical securities to be accounted for differently, though the reason for the difference in treatment must be explained in the notes to the financial statements. Investors may thus choose the fair value option instead of using the cost or equity methods for accounting for an investee. The procedure is much like accounting for trading securities and unrealized gains and losses appear on the investor's income statement. Also, if the fair value option is chosen, dividends are handled the same way as under the cost method. In other words, they give rise to dividend income. Assume that ABC Corp owns 40% of XYZ Corp and the balance in the investment account before taking into account investee income and dividends for 21X is $1 million. Assume XYZ Corp reports $100,000 of net income for 21X and declares a $50,000 dividend on December 31st, 21X. On December 31st, 21X, ABC calculates the fair value of its XYZ stock is $1.1 million. The next slide shows how this is calculated.
Under the fair value option, ABC Corp does not accrue its pro rata share of XYZ net income. ABC Corp does recognize dividend income of $20,000 upon XYZ's declaration of its dividend. ABC Corp would debit the investment account for $100,000 and credit the unrealized gain on XYZ stock also for $100,000 to recognize the unrealized gain on the XYZ stock.